Hello, you're watching Eye on Africa. I'm Rochelle Harrison Pless. Thanks for joining us. Coming up. Nigeria at the centre of a damning report from Amnesty International, the NGO accusing the country's military of killing at least 150 pro Biafra protesters since August last year. The ongoing election in Somalia is far from democratic, but given the country's troubled history, the so-called limited vote is a step towards political normalcy. And in the land of the mighty Springboks, hockey is not the most popular sport, but one South African club is hoping to help change that, nurturing some of the country's top hockey talent. But first, a quote, trigger-happy approach to crowd control. That's according to Amnesty International, which has released a damning report against the Nigerian military. The NGO accuses the country's security forces of killing at least 150 pro-Biafra protesters since August last year. Demonstrators have been calling for an independent state for Nigeria's Igbo people in the country's southeast. The army has shut down and denied the allegations. Well, for more on this story, let's cross to our correspondent in Abuja, Chika Odua. Chika, a very good evening to you. What more can you tell us about these very serious allegations? Well, the report that was released today by Amnesty International is it's quite chilling. It's a comprehensive analysis. Uh, even the title of the report alone says everything. It's called Nigeria. Bullets were raining everywhere. And Amnesty International basically compiled evidence. They compiled videos, photographs, um, different accounts. They spoke to over 200 people who were on ground at many of these protests. And of course, the protests that we're referring to are supporters of Nigerians who want to create a new state called Biafra. And of course, this document, this report, actually talks about how the protest ex escalated at several times and actually accuses the Nigerian military of leading a campaign to squash this movement to crack down on civilian Nigerians who are demanding some sort of change. So that's really what the report is all about. It also talks about uh, people who were uh, killed as far as being tortured. Some people are still in detention. It also quotes a man, 26-year-old, who says that a soldier pushed him into a gutter and poured acid on him. So it's a very shocking, chilling report that Nigerian government is having to face. And tell us a bit more about the uh, pro-Biafra movement and what is behind uh, the recent uh, resurgence. Well, the movement is more than 50 years old now. Of course, people from southeastern Nigeria, the Igbo people, they declared their own state in 1967. Uh, and that actually led to the Nigerian Civil War, which is also known as the Biafra War. Um, after the war, more than a million people were left dead. It was a three-year war. And after the war, the movement kind of got quiet, but it has resurged again in the past year, ever since the leader of the new movement, uh, Mr. Nambi Kano was put in prison and charged with treason, and he's been detained under in custody under the orders, the direct orders of the Nigerian president himself, Mr. Muhammadu Buhari. So his his supporters, the pro Biafrans, are angry. They want him to be released. And this is really why the movement has escalated once again. And we're seeing shocking deaths, just as the one that was reported today in Amnesty International's report. Okay, Chika, thank you very much uh, for updating. Us on that story, Chika Odua reporting from Abuja. Closing in on a former Islamic State stronghold in Libya, pro-government forces are tightening the noose around the coastal city of Sirte. They say they captured 25 houses and a cache of weapons from IS militants during Thursday's advance. Military spokesmen say the jihadi hideouts are now limited to just a few streets and that only 70 houses remain under Islamic State control. The troops are backed by U.S. airstrikes but have come up against bomb attacks and booby traps as they battle to flush out the IS. Next, Somalia's ongoing election is far from democratic, although it does mark a turning point in the country's long and rocky road to democracy. Out of a population of 12 million people, only 14,000 Somalians are heading to the polls, and uh, they're only voting for MPs. It's the MPs and senators who will pick the president, and that will happen behind closed doors. But this so-called limited election is progress, uh, compared to past votes when only clan elders could cast their ballots. 
The vote is part of Somalia's ongoing election, which began last month. Just 14,000 of the country's 12 million citizens are voting for 275 MPs, who will join appointed senators to select a new president. With winners often negotiated in advance, it falls far short of a democratic election. But given the country's history of violence and civil war, for Somalia, this is progress. My voice mattered in this election, and I voted for the right candidate, and he won. So we're excited. We're going to be the, the change in the community. This election is fair and well organized. We're happy because this is the first time we've seen people selecting their candidates. As of the year 2000, a series of transitional governments were formed abroad, until in 2012 the current parliament was appointed in the capital Mogadishu. Voting is now taking place in towns across the country, although observers say there are numerous problems. Examples of intimidation, examples of candidates being prevented from, uh, you know, uh, uh, putting their names forward or being prevented physically from going to locations. There's a lot of money changing hands. In the southern port city of Kismayo, elders from the Rare Hassan clan accuse local officials of rigging the vote, an allegation they fiercely deny. When all MPs are selected, there will be a presidential vote, but with missed deadlines prolonging an already drawn-out process, it's unclear when that will happen. To the Gambia now, where the country's sacred crocodile pools are believed to have supernatural powers. Infertile women, sick children and even businessmen looking to make a buck flock here to pray for a miracle. And with the presidential election just one week away, politicians are joining in, hoping for an electoral boost. On the 1st of December, opposition candidates Adama Barrow and Mama Kande will take on longtime leader Yaya Jame at the polls. The top politician come here to come and pray here to win the election, so that they can win the election. Because this place, they normally believe this place is a holy place. Because this place was in 16, over 1,600 years now. And finally, South Africans may be known for their prowess on the rugby pitch, but a club in one township near Cape Town is churning out future hockey stars. Even a former Springbok has picked up a hockey stick. Our correspondents went to see the club for themselves, a hotbed of up-and-coming sporting talent. They proudly train on AstroTurf and they teach hockey in Koza, Nelson Mandela's mother tongue. Coaches find new talent every year in Lunga's hockey club in this township bordering Cape Town. We have, we have the guys who, who played now in the, in the Premier League, Premier Hockey League, which is was, was the first for, for South Africa. So yeah, we always have players in, going into, into the, to the province and now in the national team. Youngsters want to play here because they know this is where the very first black players started their international careers. The t-shirts of the champions are well exhibited in the clubhouse, like the one of Longile Tolekile, who represented the country in the 2008 Olympic Games. Longile is still in Langa, fighting to make hockey more popular. When you come to a township, bring a soccer ball, bring a rugby ball, bring a netball ball. And um, yeah, the, the reaction is, is always like that. And everyone always asks, how did you get to play hockey when you live in the township? Where did you start? Did you start at, your, at, the, at a private school? I was like, no, I didn't start at a private school. I started in Langa. And, um, and everything here is, yeah, I started in Langa and I'm going to continue and I'm going to end here. The club was created in 1987 and is still going strong. The manager today is Lungile's brother, who is constantly looking for more sponsors. Uh, financial club is, is, is a big mission. Yeah, we have been surviving, uh, but only just. Uh, we survive from uh, like private sponsors who donate anything from old sporting clothes to some cash here and there. Uh, what we normally do with that uh, old piece of clothing that we get is we resell them at, uh, at a cost so that we can be able to afford transport and uh, money for coaches. Yeah. The chairman wants more exposure for his players to make it to higher levels. So every Friday, the team gets together for a run around the township. 30 years down the road, Lunga's Hockey Club needs more recognition. Hey boys. 
Well, that's it for now. I'll be back in around 45 minutes with more African news. Mark Owens up next as Live from Paris continues. Stay with us.